in their time and in their need. And so this is one of those such messages that we'll be preaching this morning. And it really speaks to us a lot about the internal things that are happening in the churches. You'll notice that Paul is writing through uh, to all of the churches. We're going to preach through the seven churches as best we can uh, to get some insight into some of the things that were happening inside the churches and how they need to be addressed or Paul would address those things. And uh, this one here is the, the Romans church. And let's, uh, if we will, let's just, let's just, let's pray. Then we'll stand and read and reverence the word of God. Father, in Jesus' name, God, we thank you today for your grace and kindness, your great mercy that you would have to us that we should be called the children of the true and living God. We know that you are a God who has put together the church. You have organized and orchestrated the church in such a way that it should function for your honor and for your glory and for your kingdom purposes. And so, Father, help us today to be a people who would, uh, Lord, look into the insight that you would give us through your word today and help us to understand things that you're showing us and sharing with us so that we might be faithful, Lord, to be a, be a people who would prepare ourselves for the pastor that you're preparing for us, that we would be uh, that we'd be on track with everything that needs to be done in our lives. Not only that, Lord, but this uh, message, as all, would speak to us volumes about a multitude of things, about the family, about our, our workplace, or various other things. So have your way and your will. Speak as you desire to speak. You said in your word that your word would accomplish exactly what you purpose for it to. So whatever the purpose might be in the lives of individuals, I pray that it would, uh, it would accomplish that very thing today. Have your way in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Stand with me, please, as we read. And read. We're going to start our reading in Romans chapter 1 and verse number 8. Romans chapter 1, starting in verse number 8. Paul is writing to a church that he's never been to when he writes to the book of Romans. He says, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ, for you all, that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I serve in my, my spirit, in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayer, making request if by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come to you. For I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end that you may be established. That is, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and of me. Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was let hitherto, that I might have some fruit among you, even as among other Gentiles. I am debtor, both to the Jew and to the barbarian, both to the wise and the unwise. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are in Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. You may be seated. One of the things that I've noticed as we uh, read through the book of Romans, I was, uh, I was able to, uh, I've taken some Bible college classes and this past uh, two years the professor asked me if I would write a seminary lesson on the book of Romans. So I've done a lot of study in the book of Romans and I really enjoy the study of the book of Romans. A lot of, a lot of our theology that we stand on and believe comes from the book of Romans. Paul delves into it. You know somebody once said that Jesus established the church but Paul organized it. Paul was the one who gave the theological context and understanding that would help the church to establish and to grow to the point where it is today. And still the writings of Paul today are very essential in our learning and understanding of the things that are uh, to be, be accomplished in the church. But one thing I notice, and you see it mentioned several times there, Paul is mentioning to the church, and he, he is addressing something in a very sublime way. He is talking first to the Jew first and also to the Greek, to the Jew first and also to the barbarian. As a theme that you'll see Paul uh, going all through the book of Romans and he's addressing. In fact, Paul takes Romans chapter number 9, 10, and 11 and he speaks specifically of the Jewish people. 
If you'll read in the book of Romans chapter 1 through 3, Paul is addressing three different groups of people. And he brings them together under, under uh, one conclusion, which is Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so what Paul is methodically trying to do is bring some organization to the church because the realization is that the church is a, is a makeup of people from different backgrounds, from different religious upbringings, from different, back, uh, different talents and different abilities, different socioeconomic classes in the church. And so Paul is trying to bring unity into the church. He's trying to bring the church together and help the church to function together as one body. He gives a very clear illustration in several of his epistles about how that the church is as a body. It is the body of Christ that is one that is together. Paul teaches us that even not only that, but not only that we all have sinned, but he also says that we all come through the same means of salvation. And so Paul is trying to bring the church together. All throughout Paul's ministry, Paul was hounded by the Judaizers who constantly were coming behind him and saying that you must be circumcised in order to be saved. People were constantly trying to change the teachings that Paul had put out there. They were bringing division in the church. And ultimately what would happen, you see it happening in the church. You would see a fellowship of believers. And within that fellowship, there was a division between the fellowship uh, of the individuals. Now that thing has happened to continuously in our world today, and even so much so that we're even in our world today, we've tried to make it somewhat acceptable in our world today. One of the most intriguing things to me is that why would a Georgia fan marry an Alabama fan and then go out and buy a license plate that says house divided? Are we trying to uh, accentuate upon this? You know, this is something that is happening throughout our culture and throughout our world today. But when it happens in the church, it becomes a problem. It becomes a problem. And so Paul is very methodical in trying to address the divisions that are happening in our churches today. And even so, we've seen it in our churches in, in years past. The great movement of the of the contemporary music that has inundated our churches has brought in a a, a, a group of people who were who like a certain kind of music. Where traditionally we were served with this kind of music, the traditional music. And so what that has done is pastors have tried to do their best over the years to try to try to pacify or to make satisfy everyone and so they started doing a, a, a one worship service in the morning with contemporary music and another service with traditional music but pastors have found that to be a huge problem because exactly what has happened is what Paul is trying to address here to keep from happening it was to, what pastors have dealt with is Two separate churches or people divided within the fellowship of the body of Christ. And that doesn't work and it doesn't bring things to a right fashion or a right shape. And even so, we find the same thing happening in our homes as well. I'm friends with a, a young couple and she was brought up in a fundamentalist independent Baptist church. She sings out of the red back hymnal, plays the piano, does a fantastic job, but her husband plays in a praise band and there's division. They're divided over the music style that they enjoy and they worship under. And so these things begin to happen. But I want to notice that Paul is dealing with these issues. He's trying to subtly bring forth an understanding that the church is a, uh, is a organization, an organism, if you will, of a body that is supposed to function together. And there is supposed to be no division within the body. And so what happens here is we see Paul addressing it so that the church can continue to move forward. Paul is already writing to a church that he has not been to. Evidently, he's caught wind of saying some things that are happening in the church, and he's trying to address them so that he can go, when he goes there, he can address the issues that are there. And so I want to notice some things about what happens when we see this 
fellowship of the church begin to divide over issues, over ministries, over music, over translations, over various things. What does it do and why is it so, uh, so spoken against in the scripture? First of all, I notice that a divided fellowship cripples the ministry of the church by excluding some of the spiritual gifts. The Bible says that when God saves an individual, we are given a spiritual gift to which we are supposed to serve the Lord. If you're saved and in the house today, you have a gift. And your gift is not a gift to make you a better person. It is a gift for you to serve the body of Christ with. And you are put together by God who is sovereign over all of his creation and Lord over all of his church. He has put you in this church to use your gift for the edification of the church, for the building up of the church, and for the evangelization of the lost. You are here for a very specific purpose. Why? Because the God in heaven has placed you here, and he's given you a ministry, and he's given you a, a, a people to work with in the church. But what happens is when we see ministries begin to divide, and people begin to separate within the church, it cripples the church. Why? Because the Spirit gifts are not all being used the way they should be used. Paul addresses it in Romans chapter 12 and verse 4. For we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office. So we being many are one body in Christ, and every member members one of another. So then having gifts, offerings, uh, uh, gifts, um, so then gifts, offering according to the grace that is given unto us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the portion of our faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministry. And he goes on, and he mentions a number of the spiritual gifts that are mentioned in the scripture. And so what happens here is when we see the spiritual gifts that are given unto a church, especially in a small church, if there are people who have divided from the fellowship of the church or divided for various other reasons, we see that the spiritual gifts are not being applied to the body of Christ. The Christ, the, the church is not being edified as a result of it, as it should be. I notice, my friends, that we're all different, but we're all part of one race. We're a part of the human race, and God has put us all together for a reason, my friend. We're all different, but we're all gifted differently, but we're all a part of one body, and that's the body of Christ, and we're here, my friend, to serve and to function in ministry together. In ministry together. That's why we're here to serve and to function together. The spiritual gifts that we're talking about are, are, are talking about, we're, we're not talking about skills. We're not talking about talents. We're not talking about natural abilities. Those are not spiritual gifts. They are divinely imparted gifts that God gives to a believer and they receive them the moment that they're saved and the purpose is for evangelizing the sinner and the purpose is for equipping the saints. Paul mentions it in Romans chapter 12 and verse 4. Now there are diversities of gifts but the same spirit. There are differences of ministration but the same Lord. There are diversities of operations but the same God which worketh all in all but the manifestation of the spirit is given to everyone to profit with all and so when we see ministries or things that are uh, separating from the church or when we see bodies of, of individuals or groups of people that have broken off and they're holding on to one another that, that, that we see this thing happening where the whole church is not at profit profiting with one another. Have you ever been in a church today where, where there's been people of one group or one believer sitting on one side and the other side, there's, there's people believe something differently. They want to go to the same church. They want to hold on to the same establishment, but they don't want to agree on the issues. And they don't want to work together for the cause of Christ and for the purpose that God has given us. Well, the scripture says right here that the spiritual gifts is not for the profiting of some 
or for groups. It says for the profiting of all. And so when God gives us those spiritual gifts, when he places us in the body, he gives us an understanding, my friend, that this is for the purpose of the whole body. And regardless of the difficulties, regardless of the differences uh, a church may face, we can't intentionally separate from one another uh, from the bodies of Christ. Now listen to what 1 Corinthians 12 and 20 says. But now there are many members, but yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Divisions are carnal. And so what we find here is that people are, uh, Paul was already addressing that because people in the church were saying that there was, that, 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 they, that they don't belong here or certain ones don't belong in the church. I found, my friend, that there are things that happen in the church that we don't understand sometimes. There are difficulties and challenges that every church is going to face. It's just part of the human nature and dealing with these issues, trying to find out how we can function and work together. But I noticed, my friend, it's not our place to say we don't need so-and-so around here. We don't need so-and-so around here. We don't need that kind of thing. Now, I believe it's a, a, the, the, in the autonomy of the church. Autonomy means the church is self-governing. There is no one that governs over this church. You are self-governing. You have conferences and you make your own decisions in the church. But I believe, my friend, what happens in, in the church sometimes is church folks will divide and they'll separate. And they'll say that we don't need so-and-so in our body. Well, let me tell you what. If God is so sovereign that he would choose to put individuals in this church, to join this church, to be a part of this church fellowship, he has a purpose for them. And it's not for you to say that they don't belong. They were, that's what Paul is addressing with the Corinthian church. He's addressing the issue that there is a spiritual gift there. And what's happening is some are saying that we don't need them. We don't need that part around here. Uh, even some difficult things that happen in, in our lives and in our ministry. I've been a part of various other ministries and operations. I'm with a ministry and I work with a ministry that we go to the Super Bowl outreach with. And when I first joined up with that ministry, that ministry was predominantly men who were of a different belief system than I was. But we all had this one concept. We were going to go out and we were going to preach Christ and Him crucified. We weren't going to fight over the doctrinal differences. Now let me tell you what, the first couple of years weren't easy. It was a challenge for me to go in there and, and make fellowship with those guys because there were a lot of people who wouldn't have anything to do with me. They wouldn't even talk to me. They wouldn't even say something. And, and so what happens is we just got to keep working sometimes and work out the differences. We got to keep plugging along because if God puts you in a ministry, if God puts you in a church, he's got a reason and a purpose for you to be there. And my friends, if you quit before it's too early, You'll, you'll miss out on the blessings that God has for you. You'll miss out on the ministry that God wants to do through you in that particular church or that individual. We can't exclude them. We can't tell people that they don't belong uh, for the various things. And so the Bible says that God says that we were all made to be together. We're all supposed to work together. 1 Corinthians 12, 12, for the body is one and we are many members and all members have not uh, members of one body. Being many are one body in Christ. For by one spirit were you all baptized into one body, whether you be Jews or Gentiles. There's one word that you'll find common in that passage of scripture, and that's one. We're all one under the same head, the Lord Jesus Christ. We're all one by the same spirit of God. We're all diverse, and we're all gifted differently, but we're one. And that's what we've got to come to as an understanding of who we are as a church. And so excluding spiritual gifts will cause the whole church to suffer as a result of it. 1 Peter 4.10 As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another. As good stewards of the manifold grace of God. And so what happens here is we find people uh, who will who exclude others from the church 
And then we're, we're missing spiritual gifts. If there's one thing that churches are in need of in our world today that we live in, as I travel around the country and work with various churches, I hear pastors saying the same thing. We need workers. We need workers. We need workers. They're looking for people. Where are they? Most of the time, they're sitting in the pew. And they're just not doing anything. They've excluded themselves. Or someone else has excluded them. Someone else has spoken up and said something to them. Hurt their feelings or pushed them away. And so what's happening, my friend, is when we exclude uh, the, the, the other members, the whole church suffers. The ministry of the church suffers. Everything begins to fall apart as it. As the members of the church uh, have been divinely placed in the body of Christ, we've already talked about that. Not, not only has each member been divinely placed, but their spiritual gift was divinely fitted to the church. 1 Corinthians 12, 24, For our comely parts have no need uh, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to the part which lacketh, and that there should be no schism uh, in, in the parts. And so what the Bible is teaching us is that God has put the church together. God has given us a church. He's given us a place to serve. He's given us a gift to serve. And he's put us all together. And it's a divine thing. And God has done such a great work of putting the church together. And so dividing the fellowship oftentimes cripples the ministry of the church. It cripples the ministry by excluding some of the various members. Secondly, I want to notice that a divided fellowship also stifles the leadership's work in the church. Paul was ministering in Corinth. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 1, and following, and I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but even as unto carnal, as of babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, and hitherto you are not able to bear it, neither now ye able to bear it. For ye are carnal, and whereas uh, there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? For one saith, I am of Paul, another I am of Apollos. Are ye not carnal? Paul is saying there that there, what was happening in the church, they're saying, I, I like Paul and his teaching. Others were saying, well, I like Apollos and his teaching. And they were divided within the fellowship of the church. And Paul makes the comment there. He says, my ministry has been stifled because the church is divided. I tried to feed you with the good word of God and understanding of the things so that you can grow and be mature believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, but I can't do it. I've got to feed you with the milk. Why? Because there is a division. There is a problem within the church. And when Paul says that, he says, you are carnal and you're walking as men. You're not walking as a spiritual organization in the Lord. And so what's happening here is there's this division that's happening and the leadership of the church is stifled in their ministry. Why do you think sometimes pastors are frustrated? They say that the number of pastors that are leaving the ministry or quitting are, are just this a phenomenal amount of people walking away from the ministry. Here's one of the things that's happening. When you work in a church and you pour your heart out, you pour your heart into a church, spending hours on your knees praying, spending days of studying the scripture, planning and preparing and working in the church, and you got half the church going this way, half the church going this way, and the ministry can't go forward because the church is going two different directions. It's a stifling effect on the ministry. Now, if that happens in the workplace, there's going to be a whole lot of people that lose their job. We can't do that in the church. We all work together and we've all got to figure out a way to make it all come back together. And so Paul was saying here, we can't have people who are of Paul. We can't have people who are of Apollos. You're all of Christ and that's where you belong. And therefore, my friends, and Paul is saying that my ministry has been stifled by the things that are happening. How can a shepherd shepherd his sheep when he's got half the flock in the east pasture and half of the flock in the west pasture? That's what's happening in some of our churches today. Pastors are trying to shepherd the flock when you've got people going different directions. You've got people doing these various things. 
This is a lesson I had to learn many years ago in ministry as a young evangelist. You know, when God called me to preach, I was young and I was zealous and I was all about my ministry and you should be all about your ministry. But my ministry was all about my ministry and I wouldn't come under the authority of my pastor's ministry. And so there was this battle, there was this continuous uh, fighting between me and my pastor. We were constantly button heads over issues and God had to finally slow me down and show me, my friends, that you can't go two different directions. You're stifling the pastor's ministry. And so we've got to learn this lesson and we've got to come to an understanding. This is the issue that Jesus was dealing with when he dealt with Peter in John chapter number 21. Peter, do you love me? Yea, Lord, you know I love you. Feed my sheep. Well, what is Peter doing? Peter, Jesus has already given Peter instructions about his ministry. And Peter said, I go a fishing. And there he goes off to the Sea of Galilee. Jesus is trying to go this way. Peter's going that way. And Jesus is dealing with the issue. He's calling Peter back. He's saying you need to get under the authority of me. And we'll both go the same direction. We can't go separate directions and have things going in the right way. A caring pastor will build up his church. But a caring church will support and build up their pastor. Your pastor, you don't, do, you don't think your pastor's doing a good job? What are you doing to help him? Are you going a different direction than him? You see, that's one of the things that, well, as I said, we're trying to help the church to get right on issues so that we can make sure that when the pastor does come in, that everything is going to be a smooth transition and we're all going to be moving in the right direction. Each member of the church is admonished to know their pastor and to esteem them highly in love. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 12, And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord, and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and to be at peace among yourselves. Your pastor is not your lunch buffet. Your pastor is here to feed you the good word of God. You are to take in the diet that he feeds you and to walk in the ways that he is leading and guiding you. And you're not to be going in a different direction. The Bible says that we're to know our pastor. We should know our pastor. And we should walk in the ways with them. You know, I, I mean, this is something I think we all could learn. I, we all need to be a, a people who would love and support people and, and walk in the ways of God. We need to know our pastor and we need to esteem them highly in love. And in order for us to, uh, to, to uh, in order for each member to be under the pastoral authority, uh, they must be in line with the vision of the pastor. Now, that's one of the things that's going to happen when the new pastor comes in here. He's going to come in here with vision. Where did he get it from? God. God gives him the vision. The Bible says without vision, people perish. God gives the people vision. And the pastor comes. He casts the vision before the people. And the people make a choice. Are they going to follow through with the vision and the ministry that God has given that man for, for the leading of the church and guiding us in the way that we should go? Or are we going to go our own way? Or are we going to continue the way that we used to go? This is not the way we used to do it in the church. And so what's happening here is we're pointing out to us various things that are happening. Not only should we know our pastor and esteem him very highly in love, we should be a people who supports him in his ministry. We should be a people who works with him. We're instructed to follow the leadership of our pastor. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 7, it says, Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. And it goes on on to say that they're watching after your souls. We should be a people who are following the lead of our pastor. We need to make up our mind. We need to make a resolve now that before the pastor ever gets here that we're going to know him. We're going to love him. We're going to respect him. We're going to follow the vision that he casts before us. Otherwise, we're going to have problems and not a smooth transition. And so what happens is when we're going a different direction, the ministry is stifled. And that's not what God has in store for us or for any other church. 
he has in store for us to grow and to be victorious. The Bible says that when God, Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And so what Jesus intends to build is a victorious church. A church who is triumphing, a church who is doing the will of God, building up the kingdom of God, honoring God in all of the things that are essential and not our own way. That's why Paul addressed them and he says, you're carnal. <laughs> you, you know, I, I've sent you Apollos and I've come and preached there myself and you're walking in the flesh. You're doing what you want to do. You went back to your old ways. You're doing things your own way. We've got to remember, my friends, that we're stifling the ministers of the church. We're stifling our minister when we're not, when we're a divided fellowship. Divided fellowship also enables the potential for heresies. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 18. For from the first time when ye come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you. I partly believe it, for there must also be heresies among you, that they which are approved may be manifest among you. Originally, the, in the Greek, the word heresy meant to choose or a thing chosen. And so what it means to us when Paul is saying here, there's a division in the church. And, and because there's a division, there's got to be a heresy somewhere in that. There's got to be people out there who are choosing their own way. Early Christians define heresies as those doctrines or teachings that change the nature of faith so fundamentally that it no longer can be trusted to be saving faith. I preached revival for a church in Gina, Louisiana many years ago. And the church was a church start. It was a church plant that God had blessed. It was really booming. I mean, people were getting saved. The church was growing. They were in a storefront when I was there preaching the revival there. God was doing some phenomenal things. But there were some people in there who weren't in line with the pastor's vision. They weren't following the leadership of their pastor. They had their own division and they, the church began to divide. And when the church divided, all of a sudden it, it was surfaced that there was some teaching in there that Jesus is not God. There was a group of people in the church who did not believe that Jesus was God. And they were teaching it in the Sunday school hour. It caused a division, a complete separation of the body of Christ. And this is what happens. You see, when we have these divisions within the body of Christ, eventually it's going to lead to people making choices that are against the will of God, that are against the counsel of God that are against the doctrines of God, and people are going to start falling out of the church. Why? Because these things slip in. They slip in. They don't just hit us head on. Heresies slip, on, slip in, often undetected, when the fellowship is divided. Uh, Jesus tells us about it. He said, Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You see, they, they didn't just... They, they, they just slipped in and it, it looked good and all of a sudden it, it exposed itself as being what it was. And Paul, when he is making his final trip around uh, visiting with all of the churches before he goes to Jerusalem for the last time, he makes this statement. He says, I know that after my departing shall grievous wolves come in among you, not sparing the flock. Heresies slip in to a divided fellowship when they're not when there, when there is not the presence of strong leadership that is going on there. And so what's happening here is they slip in and all of a sudden they start working and these heresies and these false teachings all of a sudden go a different direction. What's happening here is sometimes we have things going on in the church where the leadership of the church doesn't have any involvement. And when that happens, my friend, oftentimes you don't know what's being taught. You don't know what's being said in those things. So it becomes a dangerous thing. But I want to notice something about the church. The church was not, uh, I said the church was designed to be a victorious church, but it was also designed to be the foundation of all truth. Not choice, truth. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 3.15, 
But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know that how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living ground, the pillar and ground of truth. The church is the establishment upon which truth stands. And the church is the pillar that holds all things up. And so when we look at the truth, the, the church, the church was not established for those things to allow these various things. The church is a very organized, it's very, very instrumental that everything function the way it's supposed to be functioning. And that the fellowship all come together. Unity is something that's talked about in almost every epistle of the New Testament. Jesus talks about it. The, all the New Testament epistles talk about it. Why? Because of the body of Christ being so diverse in our personality, in our nationality, in our upbringing. It is so essential that we come together in the cause of Christ and not be divided within the church. There's nothing wrong with being different, but there's a problem with being divided. That's where the problem is. But a divided fellowship kindles this disunity. Paul says in Romans 11, 18, If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Evidently there was a problem there. There was a disruption of unity in the church that is dealt with nearly in every New Testament epistle. It all deals with it. Paul deals with it in 1 Corinthians. We've already talked quite a bit about it. Uh, a divided fellowship can also occur while the church is assembled together. It doesn't have to be two churches splitting out of one. I remember talking to a director of missions one time, and he made the statement, he says, uh, church splits have been the only church planning strategy this association has ever had. That means there's a bunch of people mad at one another. That's not God's plan. That's not what Paul is talking about. Listen to what Paul is saying to the Corinthian church. For first of all, when ye come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you. And I partly believe it. What Paul is saying is, while you're even assembled in the same house, you're divided. This shouldn't be. We shouldn't be a divided people. Why? Because unity is absolutely paramount to the church. The Bible says in Ephesians 4, 11 and 12 and following, He gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edification of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, Unto the measure, the stature, the fullness of Christ. I think it's imperative that as we're talking about preparing the church for a pastor, is that we come together. If there be any division among the members of the church for various reasons, that we get those things settled and we get them out of the way. If there be ministries that are going here and yonder, and there's not a unity of a working together and a cooperation under a single head or a single leadership structure, then there's a problem and it needs to be dealt with. It needs to be brought up. It needs to be discussed. It needs to be worked out. We all need to come together because we're crippling the church. We may think that we're building up the kingdom of God. We're doing our ministry. They're doing their ministry. That's not the way it's supposed to work. It's not the way it's supposed to work. The modern phenomena of the divided fellowship has brought nothing but problems into the church. It's not growing the church. Churches that divide over music don't baptize more people. They don't have more people saved. They're not growing. They're not doing more. It's important for us to realize that God has a purpose for the church. And his plan is to work through the church to get us all of one mind, one accord, under one head, with one purpose, doing the same thing. Functioning together as a body of Christ. 
Now that doesn't mean that we can't have different ministries reaching out, but what it means is that we're all in fellowship with one another. We're all working together for the same cause. And so we can't have a divided fellowship. We can't have your church, my church. It's got to be his church. That's what it's got to be. And when we get to that point, God will begin to bless. And he'll begin to pour out his spirit. And we'll see the spirit of God begin to work in a very powerful, powerful way. You know, I'm planning, planning the revival and and uh, one of the things that I've really found to be essential in revival is that everybody on the revival team have the same focus. You can't have music people going this direction and the preacher going that direction. Everything has to go the same direction in order for it to work. And the same thing funnels down to you, the church. If you're gonna be a prosperous church, You've got to all be one. You've got to have the fellowship tied together and functioning for the same purpose. And so Paul addresses that. He addresses it with the Romans church. He addresses it with nearly every church that he writes to in the New Testament. Jesus addresses it. We've got to come together. We've got to be one in unity. So I want us to come together as one today in these altars and ask the Lord to reveal to us things that we need to come together on. Maybe there's some things that are divided within the fellowship. Maybe there's some division in the home. You as husband and wife might want to come down to these old-fashioned altars and, and, and talk about these things to the Lord. But I know one thing, that I want us to come together for this purpose and as we do, that we'll prepare ourselves, not only for a pastor, but for revival that will come in late July. So let's all gather in the altar today. Let's not be a divided fellowship.